Today, your ability to pivot and to embrace new projects is key. You're actually expected to change employment on a 3-5 to five year cycle in the current job market. These pivots can happen between academic positions, between academia and industry, and between non-academic jobs. This week, we'll be hearing from Simon Moore, whose stellar academic career has led him into a successful and fulfilling position in the pharmaceutical industry. If you see that something's wrong, you invest the time and effort and intellectual energy to look into it. And then when something's wrong, respectfully address the people or the group or whatever it is, the community, and explain yourself. And it's important to be respectful and to come prepared and stuff like that. And that's certainly well both in academia, but also in industry. And I find in general, people do want to know the truth or, or the reality but they also don't want to be told to it in an obnoxious way. Welcome to Papa PhD with David Mendez, the podcast where we explore careers and life after grad school with guests who have walked the road less traveled and have unique stories to tell about how they made their place in a world of constantly evolving rules. Get ready to go off the beaten path and hop on for an exciting new episode of Papa PhD. So today we're talking with Simon Moore. Simon has a very interesting career path marked by a very successful PhD and postdoc in neuroscience and cellular biophysics that ended up leading to a transition into ever more interesting and fulfilling positions in industry. I can't wait to hear what his experience in grad school and in academia was like and how he navigated his pivot into the industry arena. Welcome to Papa PhD, Simon. Thank you, David. This is an amazing podcast you have going on. I wish that I had it when I was uh, doing my grad school. So all the listeners should feel uh, very privileged uh, here uh, to have access to this sort of resource. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I really, I'm really enjoying the project and uh, I really want to, people to hear stories uh, and, and, you know, stories of success, stories of transition, and to know that, you know, th this is not a one track uh, path. You can really create your path and find different ways to be fulfilled. So again, welcome to the show. Can you please let the listeners know a little bit more about yourself and uh, how you got to where you are today? So I was born and raised in Montreal. And uh, I did my graduate uh, studies at uh, McGill University with uh, yourself, David, and uh, a couple others that have been on this podcast. Uh, so Chris Kent, Tamara Luck, and I saw Joe was one of the first ones to do it. I uh, missed those guys so much. And it was, it was really nice uh, listening to their uh, stories and seeing how they've navigated their way through. And then I went on to do a postdoc at Columbia University in New York City. And um, my sole focus really was to get... Uh, an academic position, a tenure track position to do my own research. And I had, uh, I think, like you said, a really good uh, record. I had a great, and uh, a lot of really good publications, including one in science. I had, um, and I guess people in Canada might not know of this, but then the NIH in the U.S. has something called a K99 fellowship. And that's meant to transition you into an academic position. It's called K99. And it's It's, it gives you like $750,000 to start up a lab. And usually you get that, you, you, you'll get an academic position, usually. And I had some great interviews, top departments, but for whatever reason, things didn't materialize. I'm still not sure what exactly what happened. I'd love to be able to go back and sort of maybe I was just overconfident or what, but nothing materialized. And so I had a real reckoning. I was frustrated um, and it's tough. At the time I had um, a wife and two daughters at home that depended on me and I was trying to figure out what the heck am I going to do. And so I started looking to industry and I don't know if it was just extreme luck or just what, uh, maybe just a sign of the times the way biotech was taking off. But I found a great position at a company called Vivo Therapeutics in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts. And um, they were uh, developing treatments for spinal cord injury. And so my experience had been in uh, sort of neural development and fundamental uh, mechanisms of uh, sort of axon guidance and neural regeneration. So it was a good fit. So I started there with the idea of interfacing neural stem cells with their devices, but that quickly morphed into gene therapy. So using viruses to, um, to, to, to transfer genes into cells and have some therapeutic effect. What happened after about four years is the, the lead clinical program ran into some trouble. 
and my entire department was laid off. And this is stuff that happens. Not all uh, ideas, even if they're good ones, succeed. And so luckily, I, the company was very good and was prepared for that and gave us a, a good severance package. And that whole experience gave me a lot of contacts within the industry, which is a very important to have. And then I did a short stint at a, uh, another company in Cambridge, Mass, and I was doing uh, in vivo gene editing. And that was just amazing. So I didn't, didn't know, I had never worked with gene editing technologies and gave me a great experience, great people there. But it was very early stage research. And uh, I was contacted because there's this explosion in gene therapy um, by a company in New York City. So back to where I did my postdoc. And they needed people who could do uh, the writing up for the FDA. They had a, a bunch of gene therapy programs that they wanted to get into the clinic. And so I saw that as a big opportunity and I took them up on it. And the idea was for us, uh, for my, uh, me and my family to uh, move back to New York City. I mean, we loved it there. But after about six months, there, even though professionally it was going exceptionally well and people were great, um, just became clear that we didn't want to move our family there. That our life in Boston is just really nice. Uh, a lot of the biotech is in Boston and just didn't make sense uh, to make that move. So that's uh, what happened. And about two months ago, I found this great job back in Boston at Takeda Pharmaceuticals, which is a huge pharmaceutical company. I think one of the top five five worldwide and they're making a big push or they, I mean, they already have a bunch of gene therapy programs, but they're really pushing that. And so they, um, I, I got that opportunity, interviewed, got it. And I'm in a, just a great group of people and uh, learning what it's like to do research in a large pharmaceutical because all my experiences in the smaller companies. Awesome. This is a, uh, it's, I'm super happy for you. Uh, it seems that you know doors or windows were opening to you, uh, you know, as you went, and and, <laughs> and you were taking the opportunities, which is which is great. You know, you need to show up to to to, to get uh, an opportunity to yes. to. Uh, what does that say? Uh, preparation, perspiration. Yeah, it's it's. Yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> this also means that you know there was a. Uh, a big culture change, I guess. But uh, let's maybe talk about that later, because you know, between academia and industry, mm -hmm. for sure, you get, you have stories to tell. <laughs> but um, I always like to start, uh, uh, you know, for the sake of the listeners too. I always like to start in grad school. Uh, how was it for you going to to grad school? Even uh, finding a postdoc, you know, how 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 did that go? Uh, you said you already said it. You know, you, you published well in your PhD. Um, so, what can you? Um, you know, recount from from uh, your grad school times and uh, how you navigated grad school. You know, looking at what was coming next, which in your case was a postdoc. What what were key things that you did? Uh, uh, key habits that you that you adopted? You know, with this focus and this like tunnel vision towards I'm I'm working towards my postdoc. I'm going to get it. This is what I need to do. So that's a lot of Naga. So I'd say. I, I need to put into context um, how I entered graduate school. So I had been involved previously in um, a co-op program at uh, Concordia University before I joined McGill. And I had some experience in industry uh, doing very basic uh, organic chemistry. And my interests, though, were neuroscience. And so while I was still an undergrad, it was my last year of undergrad, um, I contacted Tim Kennedy, who ended up being my supervisor for my PhD, uh, just for a summer role. And it was basically unpaid. I think he maybe gave me a thousand or two thousand dollars. And that was very different to what my co op was. So I entered in fairly uh, early, like, um, and I got a sense of what the lab was like in that summer that I had wanted to do my PhD. And I'd say Tim and I got a really built a great relationship. And uh, I got, I got, was able to navigate the good projects and have a good publication record. Um, now, what I did there that made me successful later, um, I think being in Tim's lab, what, and, and I've used this later on as well, is really being true to the science. It might sound corny, but you, if you see that something's wrong, you invest the time and effort and intellectual like energy to look into it. Um, and then when something's wrong, respectfully address 
the people or the group or whatever it is, the community, and explain yourself. And it's important to be respectful and to come prepared and stuff like that. And that's certainly well both in academia, but also in industry. And I find in general, people do want to know the truth or, or the reality, but they also don't want to be told to it in an obnoxious way. And Tim is just, Tim Kennedy, my uh, PhD supervisor, was so good at um, pushing me or, or molding me in that direction and showing me the way. Um, and so I'd say that that was the number one lesson or attitude that's sort of fueled. That's super interesting. And, and I guess this is useful, you know, especially because people may... Um, like being in like if they're a little bit introverted or something they may avoid confrontation and i think what you just said and let let me know if you agree so you know if you see something scientifically or relating to your research that uh, you know that's either wrong uh, just be frank but but build your build your case so so that you can you can support uh, whatever your comment is with with facts and uh, and also you were saying uh, to to maintain um, a certain level of uh, cordiality, let's yes. say of. Uh, and and so, it, just to give it be a little bit more specific, like two of my first authorships um, were uh, basically um, countering um, um, certain aspects, certain concepts in the field um, uh, that were either sort of recently published, and, and some of them were big groups. Uh, actually, both of them were big groups. Um, and doing it in a way that didn't make you enemies and like it was almost done in collaboration with them. Um, I see, I see, I see. Perfect. And, um, and so you did your PhD. One, one of the things that uh, I remember, you used to play hockey in, the, in the, our recreational uh, hockey team. <laughs> so how was uh, like extracurricular life for you? How, how did you balance? It's true, I didn't really think of that. Um, so yes, I was... Uh, I was quote unquote the captain of our awesome lobotomizers <laughs> team. The lobotomizers. That was so much fun. So uh, to give a context, being from Montreal, I'm pretty good at hockey. I, I, for a Montrealer, I'd say I'm, I'm behind. I'm not a great player, but in terms of an international grad school, I was like an all star uh, for for the level that we were at. We were playing. We were basically playing lowest level. It was co-ed. The team was like usually half half girls, half guys. And mostly what it was is about afterwards uh, going to the, to the, to the, like, uh, to the bar and just having a good time. And so that was, I think really good because you learn and the way that started out is very organically. Like I, I wanted to, to play hockey and um, basically uh, I met this other guy who also wanted to play hockey, but they had no team. So we got together and we formed a team. And that was uh, earlier on um, in, in in undergrad and then in graduate school, I, I, I knew the ropes enough that I, I, I formed that team. And that, that's good. I mean, it's a very informal sort of management. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wouldn't even call it that. It's just basically like structured mm -hmm. fun. That's yeah. Good. And uh, so apart from that, were there other things that you were doing, you know, to, to kind of have a PhD life balance? Yeah. I mean, um, I did have, uh, I ended up getting married before my PhD. Um, and that was, uh, I think it's very healthy to not be too involved that you don't look after yourself that way. Um, if you're too focused, I think you lose, uh, the forest from the trees and stuff like that. And my wife has just been exceptional throughout both my grad work and later on we try and support each other. And there are difficult times that I'm sure we'll get to and how to deal with them, but family is very important. And if you don't have that structure if you don't um, sort of foster those bonds to your family and uh, it makes it a lot more difficult definitely so the next step that came was was the postdoc and so this means that you you know whatever was going to happen in in that in the postdoc you were going to bring your family with you you so you know it was a move not you weren't moving alone yeah and so uh the way we sort of worked and it it was lucky again um the only the request that my wife had was to go to a larger city. She didn't want to be stuck in the middle of nowhere, and she was pretty sure she didn't want to do research anymore. So um, it would be extra hard to go to some remote location and do a postdoc. Um, so we went to New York City, and 
uh, there we had two children as I was a postdoc, which is tricky enough because you're, you're spending long hours in the lab trying to build your career. You're, and then not sleeping. Uh, exactly. <laughs> when you, you, you're trying to do research when you haven't slept all night. And to be fair, my wife was not working. She did the vast majority of it, of the raising of the kids in those early years. Um, but still, you're, I mean, we're in a one bedroom apartment and you're not sleeping and um, you're still trying to support her as much as you can. And so, yeah, stuff. So you zeroed in on New York and it, was it easy to find, uh, you know, to, to, to find your, your first uh, position? Yeah, I interviewed at a few labs and they they all happened to be at Columbia, but I did look at all the different, uh, New York city has like, I'd say like four really good universities, research universities. Um, but uh, they happened to be at Columbia and I settled at um, uh, Mike Sheets. Um, and so he may not be that widely known. He was in on the discovery of, um, um, kinesin motors, those motor proteins that traffic vesicles. And he's won uh, all these awards for that. So the Lasker Award is usually something that uh, you win before you get the, the Nobel Prize, and he's won that. As a supervisor, it was a very different environment than Tim's lab because he had such a larger lab, and he'd also taken up a position that brought him spent where he spent most of his time in Singapore. So um, even yeah, it was a lot less supportive environment um, than Tim Kennedy's lab. Um, but it was outstanding. Like you had all the, the financial resources of a large lab and all the equipment. And I think also just the other postdocs that you have, can use as resources. It's just outstanding. And so I think, as you know, uh, within about a year or so, I published in, in Science. It was just a super short article, but I'm not sure you can do that in many other places. Um, and his clout in the field, I'm sure, also helped that publication. Um, and so there are all these things that take the good with the bad uh, that uh, that environment gives you. And um, yeah, and so that that was a, a great experience being in New York City, <laughs> great city to live in. And uh, the way Columbia sets you up, uh, we're able to have two children, and it was a very nice environment. Excellent. And and so. How did you, you know, you probably started uh, looking and started uh, writing writing emails, uh, letters, I don't know exactly, but to, to potential labs before you defended. Oh, you know. okay. uh, how was that process? Uh, you know, how, how did you go about finding, you know, well, you followed your interests, I guess, right? But yeah. then the, the whole process of promoting yourself, kind of, you know, selling your 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 uh, publication track record etc cetera, etc cetera. how was that process so that's um and it for me in my particular path and there are many paths and there's no right or wrong way of doing it for me it was a bit of an extension of my graduate work i had sort of seen some stuff that i wanted to know more about and it was like mechanical aspects of axon guidance and understanding sort of the how the small forces could trigger signaling and so that's that mechanical transduction. And that's, I was seeking out labs that would allow me to pursue that. Um, I, on top of other things, I was trying to keep it an open mind as possible, but because I had such a clear idea of what I thought was an important question, and this also speaks again to Tim Kennedy letting me do that. I mean, he probably also had that, uh, I mean, no, he definitely did have that appreciation that there was something there but didn't necessarily have the tools or the resources to get at it. And he let me go to, go to Mike's lab and pursue that. I sent him early drafts of the, of the paper as well. And he was very supportive, which is not easy to do. I'm sure he would have um, uh, liked to have done those studies as well. And so, yeah, it's, it, I think it's going to be different for everybody. It's, it's, you have to be interested in it and you also have to be realistic. Like, is this going to get you to somewhere where you want to be? And so I have a really good friend, Nick Trish, and his approach was a little different. He heavily weighted um, that uh, PI's um, track record of transitioning people to academic positions. If that's your goal. I think that's a really important thing to take into consideration is how have they been at getting people academic positions? Because it's, it's not entirely based on your, your skills and your qualifications. There's a huge input that the PI can have on that. And 
again, for the sake of, of, of the listeners out there who might be looking for the postdoc right now, how was the 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 interview process how did that i'm i'm curious myself you know because i didn't go that path how how do you go uh, what what happens once you get to the to the pi he saw your cv he's interested in in talking with you yeah. how does that happen what's what are the questions that are asked what what are they looking for i think one of the things you learn very quickly are that if you're a capable scientist you can pretty much get any postdoc <laughs> You're basically very cheap labor to a, a PI. You don't have to do any coursework like a grad student. You can dedicate all your time. You have a certain, you should be much more autonomous and obviously an early scientist and you, um, of course, a little bit more mature. Um, and so I, for me, the challenge wasn't the postdoc. It was, it was getting the PI position and working my way to industry. That that's, for me, and I'm not sure if that's what others will go through, is once you, yeah, I didn't have much resistance. I think most of the PIs that I emailed, and you usually have to email them more than once. I mean, you have to be persistent with this. Uh, but if you have a clear idea of what you want to do and you think there's a good fit, there probably is, then they'll go for it, and then they'll like it, and then uh, they'll get it. So then you spent... Uh, a couple of years, I think five years, uh, four or five years, uh, working as a postdoc and trying to go into professoriate or anyway into, into being a PI, etc. How did that? How did those four years go? And um, and when did you start understanding that okay, this might not materialize? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I remember that very, it, like, it's funny how you, you sort of forget that it was incredibly stressful. At the end. Okay, so just first off, the way it started, it started off great. Like I said, science publication, got a great review article in the uh, developmental cell. I was so proud of that. It, it just really took and tried to synthesize a very large body of mechanotransduction work. Very happy with that paper. And then it was uh, trying to follow up that and working towards it and just, the K99, writing the K99 um, and getting that was huge. And there was definitely a high and a certain confidence that I had. And I was getting, uh, I applied for positions at like top universities, like the neurobiology at Harvard, went and interviewed. And at the beginning, you're like, of course, it'd be awesome. It's going to work out. I'm getting these great departments to, uh, to interview me. And I'd say in the early bits, even though I was pretty good at giving seminars, I was maybe a little bit too nervous and giving off too much information. And I remember a few of the early interviews not going well, uh, being too detailed. You need to rise above your science. Um, and that's true for, I think, for a PI position and for an industry. You need to get a larger view and have bigger concepts. That's, uh, that's what will really sort of take you forward. And I, I think that might have been uh, at least early on what I wasn't doing enough. And then, and then when it's they're like all the letters are coming in that no, sorry, we're not interested, or or we've moved on, and uh, all the best luck. That's when it starts to get a lot more real. Um, and for me, I had a couple cycles to go through. So I I had gotten some of those interviews even before I got the K99, but then I had two years with that, and then. After that first year of it not working out, that's when I started getting a little bit nervous and becoming a little bit more serious and um, bringing in some networks to be like, what am I doing wrong? And my, I think I probably got a little better at that. Um, but still, it's incredibly tough to, to get a, a top academic research position. It's, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, and then when things, especially towards the end, you have two children at home, and um, it starts to get very stressful. And how to deal with that stress, I know it's, uh, it's coming along later. But for me, it was going uh, going on some runs, de-stressing. Work, uh, my wife was really good at that as well, too, and uh, uh, coaching me through it. And that sort of lets you, you need to bring it down to a level where your stress is constructive because there's that bell-shaped curve, right, where it start, stops being productive. <laughs> So you got to get yourself where you can sort of chill out a little bit, look at the situation. And that's where I started applying. And I think my first applications to industry were so great. I remember seeing there's this uh, acronym called CGMP. And it, in industry, it, everybody knows. It, it, it stands for Current um, uh, Good Manufacturing Processes. And everybody knows it. But where I was from, in Axon Guidance, it means Cycling GMP. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, I wrote a I wrote a cover letter saying I know so much about cycling GMP, and then afterwards realizing that's not at all. Oh my god, <laughs> that's so funny. And, and so uh, there were a few letters that I'm sure uh, some people got a good laughs over. Um, but that's I think natural because I was really unprepared to go into industry, and then looking back, I should have maybe prepared myself, listened to people a little bit more, saying it was going to be a little bit more difficult than it. Uh, I thought it was. And then you just sort of hit the mark. Excellent. And so you just, you were saying before then that, uh, that once you started, you know, getting a bunch of, uh, of uh, thank you letters, right. Uh, that you, you went in and started to try and get some feedback on what you might be doing wrong. Uh, were, was, were these, were these people that you were talking to? Was this your supervisor? What, what type of help did you find? What type of uh, uh, good input did you get? It was really all the above, yeah. It was um, my PI and um, other PIs in the department. I, I, I clearly uh, remember this one seminar that I gave, and it was just basically giving my job talk to other postdocs in the department. And uh, I think there was one or two PIs from the department. I remember Jim Pohn being there, from, and he was also a really good mentor. And... Um, they gave me some advice, and I think it was basically that I need to sort of rise above it, bigger concepts, less details, bigger concepts. And uh, of course, also family. I mean, there's uh, like my mother uh, had a very uh, good career in, um, in uh, IT, and she had some sort of, I, I think it applies to everywhere, just some basic career advice on how to keep reevaluating your situation and trying to see where you want to go and it, it comes in all forms there's lots of advice some of it good some of the bad some of it hurts to hear as long as it's coming from a good source you got to trust the source it's yeah you gotta take it seriously <laughs> and and you, it can shatter your sort of self-image and, and the way where you want to go or your hopes and expectations and it's yeah it's it's a messy process but it, I, I think most people get there but but I guess once it's shattered, especially if it's some by someone you trust, you can rebuild it to be a better one, yeah. right? And you have to do that. Yeah. And but also keep your dreams. So I don't know where it's somewhere in between. You know, like like I think sometimes yeah, you gotta. Yeah. Yeah, I think one one of the things that that I I, I hear often is you may get lost within yourself. Uh, it's a bit something that you were mentioning before, like people get lost in their research and lo- lose touch with the outside world. Let's say. In this case, it looks like you know you're, you're someone who's uh, who's very self motivated and self reliant, and at a certain point you said, "Okay, this self reliance is good, but right now it's not serving me. I, I have to go ask other people around me." I think it's very sound uh, advice, and and it's wise. Even your peers, like even people have like just getting outside of yourself, and they they can be helpful as well. It doesn't have to be older, wiser, more experienced. Sometimes people with the same amount of experience will have some good advice. Yeah, just another brain than yours, right? <laughs> yeah, just a different perspective. So this, I guess, brings us to the end of, of your uh, your path in academia, right? And this is where the transition happens. Mm-hmm. All right, so we'll take a little pause. We'll let uh, the listeners go uh, have a little drink of water <laughs> and uh, and we'll we'll start again at the moment where you got your first uh, job offer in the industry. Before going on with the interview, I want to thank you for listening to the show. If you like an episode and feel that it's helped you or inspired you in any way, share it with your friends. Maybe it will inspire them too. At the bottom of the Papa PhD website, you'll find out how to subscribe to our newsletter and how to receive a resource sheet that will help you in your career research. And be sure to follow Papa PhD on Facebook and Twitter and to subscribe on your favorite podcast app. Happy listening and happy sharing. Welcome to part two of our interview with Simon Moore. Part two is your transition into industry. So, you know, you had this this great publication track, etc. in in academia, but at at a certain point, like we just said, it didn't materialize, the, the PI position didn't materialize, and you had to to think about, uh, you know, uh, exit strategies. Let us know maybe a little bit more about how that was, you know, how, how, 
What sort of questions did you have to ask yourself at a certain point? Because you were, you know, you were in the States, but you're Canadian. Uh, how, you know, how did you navigate that? And um, what, what, you know, obstacles you found? Uh, was it uh, anxiogenic for you in a way? Uh, yeah, let us know a little bit more about, about that transition point. Definitely ang anxiogenic, like you said. A lot of anxiety, a lot of fear, a lot of like just being very uh, uncertain about the future. Um, so there are a lot of things that go into getting an academic, um, an industry position for an academic. Um, so first it's trying to figure out what your marketable skills are. And at, at Columbia University, one of the resources we had was this guy, I think his name was Kevin Gatsby. And he, I think he went around to all the different universities and sort of gave a little lecture um, and work, workshop on transitioning to industry. And he, the major output that I got from that was to work on um, your brand. And I'm not sure how familiar people are with that, um, but basically it's, you might hear it as um, like an elevator pitch. Try to figure out what you're good at and what in industry could um, would appreciate. And so I think just globally as a PhD, obviously you can design experiments, you can do literature search, you can write scientific um, uh, publications and stuff like that. Um, you're also probably good at giving, uh, standing up in front of people because it's part of what you have to do. Um, and presenting your work. And so those are something that everybody has. And then you also have stuff that are maybe a little bit more specialized, but you also are probably very specialized, and very like incredibly focused on it, on something that's probably not marketable at all. But you, if you step that back, and so uh, for me, even though I was doing very fundamental issues of axon guns, I was looking at piconewton forces on a growth cone. What I was very good at is culture and neurons and keeping them uh, very healthy um, on artificial surfaces. And this company, um, uh, Indubal Therapeutics, what they were trying to do is, so their lead program in the clinic was this scaffold. And it looked a lot like a cigarette filter, which I was never allowed to use that analogy when I was there because that's bad connotations. But basically it was a cigarette filter that would dissolve, it was biodegradable. And The idea was is that after a spinal cord injury, you have this bruise in the middle of the spinal cord. And you go in there and you cut with a scalpel very delicately. You get all that bad bruise material that's causing, causing all the cell death. And you take that scaffold and you put it in and it sort of helps preserve the structure of the spinal cord. And there are a better outcome for the, uh, for the patient. But the The research, uh, the studies that were done, and this is all done at a Bob Langer's lab, who's a huge person at MIT. He's founded several companies, and he's basically one of the original um, bioengineers or biochemists, uh, chemical engineers. He has, I think, more, or, is, or he's only second to Thomas Edison in the number of patents he has. He's also an incredibly supportive person. So you can imagine this guy is busy. He has a, his lab is basically larger than a lot of companies like he it, it never ceased to amaze me that i could send him an email like a personal email like about something and he'd get back almost without fail within five minutes answering that direct me in the right thing and uh, i think i mentioned before that our company when it failed and laid off all the r d i know he helped many people find positions and so he's again these people like that and like It's such a good thing to do. And you realize that that's actually successful people do that. You need to be a good person <laughs> because you help out people, they'll help out you. And it's um, empathizing and realizing that people are in different situations. And um, it's a very good uh, trait now. Yeah. And so then I was very good at, at um, interfacing neurons with your substrates. That's what I had to do to measure those forces, putting on polyacrylamide or different substrates and exposing them to lasers, and crazy, crazy things. And so I was like, you want to put neural stem cells on the scaffold. 
I'm the best person to do this. And so um, that's really what you, you got to do. And he I kept it very high level. So uh, when I wrote the, uh, the letter to them, they did have a job posting. So this wasn't anything I got through my network or anything like that. It's a job posting. And I write, so this is what I'm really good at. It's a publication record, um, given the CV. And then when it came to the job interviews, the members only about 15 minutes. And so I'm giving incredibly high level points, bullet points, and just be like, okay, you're probably doing this. This is, this is what I have experience doing and I can really help you out like that. Just sort of keeping it as a discussion and also coming off as somebody that they could uh, trust in not being like a, like a Looney Tune scientist. It goes a long way. It goes a long way and just being a personable person uh, and that's very important in industry because uh, like um, one person can really sort of screw up anything in a lab or a, or a research department and you need to. So you need to fit the team, you need to fit the culture. Yeah. And being yeah professional, I mean, obviously you, you um, need to research what they're doing and people that you're going to meet with. Um, and so the company that I went to that's in vivo therapy was a pretty small company. Um, there were about 40 people when I joined. And the interview process, the first step was very, um, I think, very sort of professional and sort of like I was explaining, I gave a talk and all this stuff. And at the time, I was still interviewing for academic positions. So I think the following week, I was at um, Penn State uh, in um, Hershey, Pennsylvania. And on my way home, I had rented a car it was the easiest way to get there. Um, uh, they called me and I said, hey, we're having this thing in Cape Cod. Won't you come? And I had all these plans to have a friend coming to New York. And I'm like, I called my wife. She's like, absolutely go to this. Like, she, we were all like stressed about finding positions. So I'm like, okay, this can only help me get this position. So I went there and basically it was uh, a weekend um, at Bob Langer. He has like this great cottage there and we were staying at the hotel right beside it, but going over his house. Uh, and it's just being personable um, and um, getting along with everybody. And at the end of it, um, I got an offer and it was probably way more money than I ever would have made in, in academia. And the hours in industry are way better. I mean, you're still working heavily, stress levels are way lower. I mean, it's not existential in your team. Mm -hmm. you're not a single scientist pushing something you have so many other people you had legal business um manufacturing clinical uh, all these people you're all coming together and they're all sort of contributing um working together and it's such a richer environment and i think i didn't appreciate that in, in academia um, so this was a discovery for you it was it, it was an epiphany i didn't see that for me it was basically just a way to survive <laughs> when i was moving to industry i was like okay i guess i gotta do this um and, and getting there i was like wow this is so cool and then the idea of actually bringing stuff and making those lives better it's it is real it isn't like you, you publish a paper and like they maybe a few people cite it and inspire somebody to, to to start a cure it's just when you're in industry it's the best environment so, so some real life impact to what you do plus a team that 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 supports you and that and that's working towards the same goal that's that's excellent and and it's funny because again uh, when you're in academia and and when you haven't been in industry it's kind of a black box you don't really know the culture you don't know you know the products you see them but you don't know how the process is and how the the, the culture is it's super interesting that you that you share that with us and um, uh, did you have anything else you were going to add about making that transition, of course, sort of focus right in on that transition. I, I think I really hit home that it was a very stressful time. I didn't know, know what was going on. My funding was coming to an end. Um, uh, my uh, PI at the time, um, he couldn't really support it. He was losing his grants in the U.S. because he was spending so much time in Singapore. So it was a very stressful time. And um, these things happen. you got to find ways to bring it down to a productive level of stress. Um, and relying on your network, to I've never really seen it get you the job, but they'll help you inform on what they might be looking at and that, or at the very least just emotionally support you or Definitely. Uh, things like that. And, uh, you know, changing because you were in the States uh, uh, coming from Canada, changing from being in university, 
which which probably has a, a different status to becoming a worker you know in in a company uh, were there any obstacles related to that yeah and I, we were talking about this a little bit during the break is working in the US right now you need to be legally allowed to work obviously and so when you go to uh, an american university for a postdoc you're technically a, a worker but you're in academia and you have like all these uh, visas like uh, i think the most common one is the j1 visa um uh, or J visa, I can't remember. Um, and you, your partner can get an associated visa with that to be able to work. It's a lot of paperwork. They don't make it easy, but they can work just based on your position as a postdoc. Now, when you move from academia to industry, that's difficult because you need to have um, a visa or or something that lets you work. And as a Canadian, you can typically use the TN work permit, uh, but that will only, that is not supposed to be a permanent solution. And so you, at any time crossing over the border, they can say, no, you plan to stay there permanently. We're not gonna let you through. And you might have, you'll lose your job, you lose your, I mean, your apartment or house and things like that. So that's a very stressful time. Um, but what you can do, assuming that you have, uh, and, you don't have to have had an amazing scientific career or anything like that, um, is you go through these paths to get you a green card. And they're, um, they're, uh, the one that I used was National Interest Waiver. It's like EB1 or EB2. And there it's not cheap. It's, it was, I think a, you have to pay both the government, I think it's like $5,000 and then you should get a lawyer to help you walk through all this stuff because it's- It's complex. Yeah, very complex. And what what I had to do there is I had to contact all the people who I had not worked with, but had cited my work to write me a recommendation letter. So the people you haven't worked with and cite your work tend to be your competitors. <laughs> and so I was contacting my my like sort of quote unquote competitors. I mean, it's still a scientific, pretty friendly environment, but they would be like, "Why are you contacting me?" And they're like, "God, I don't even know you." I'm like, that's the point. You don't know me, but you know my work. And it's about my work. Wow. Um, okay. <laughs> and so you do that and you are a stress ball because you're like, uh, like for me, I was on a TN visa while I was at uh, Vivo Therapeutics and I knew I needed to get off that because it was just too much stress. I, and I, I we got to the point where we didn't even want to cross the border. Um, so and, but sometimes you need to cross the border. And, and so what we did is um, uh, we, we started that process and it ended up working out all right. Um, in about a year's time, we got sorted out, and uh, now we're uh, green card holders, and it's something that gives you that mobility. But if you don't have that, it can be very tricky to get an industry job. So if you take out on a postdoc in the U.S. and with the idea of going into industry, you, I think you can start that pro. You can definitely start that process as you're as you're still a postdoc. And, okay, um, start I know early. Others who've done that, like there's this one woman um, who did it. She was from. Iran, which you can imagine would be even potentially even harder. And she was able to get this a national interest waiver and uh, that facilitated her move to industry as a, as a postdoc. Okay. So you did have a bunch of obstacles and anxiety and you already mentioned that you have a kind of a support network that includes family, et cetera. And that's, and, and, and I guess you use that to kind of help you go, you know, go through and, uh, and uh, be where you are now, which is, which is great. Now, a question that I like to ask and and uh, to talk about is uh, transferable skills and and you know you're still doing science pretty much uh, I don't know at this point some people that I that I've interviewed uh, you know are working around often it's funny because they kind of stay around science so either either in science communication things like that but you're actually tell me if I'm wrong but you're still in the lab pretty much yeah yeah um, well and uh, since uh, yeah. I'd say yes. I'm in, I'm in the lab still. Um, I'm definitely not. I, 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 the position I have right now is very similar to like maybe what a PI would be like. You might go into the lab, but I'm not in there a lot. Um, I, there are others that are actually doing a lot more of the hands-on stuff. That wasn't true. Like even when I was at Rocket, my last uh, company, um, it was really more of a half-half situation where I was doing some bench work, but I was also doing a lot, a lot of. Um, sort of writing for the FDA and um, getting um, uh, like INDs uh, written up in like that proper language and stuff. Excellent. So 
let's say in your position today, because you know, when, when you're at the bench, it's fairly easy to surmise what the, the transferable skills from your, your doc and your postdoc are, right? But what about the, the, these new things that, you, that you had, you've had to learn in your, in your positions of more and more responsibility? Um, how did, you know, how did your, your path before, uh, be it in your PhD uh, or on your postdoc, uh, how did those help you or how do they still help you today in doing what you do? Why, why did they make you the right candidate for the position that you are in today? Is, is there some impact or are, are there, is there stuff that you had to learn from scratch uh, and, and, and on your own? Yeah, definitely nothing. I, I would say nothing from scratch, scratch. Um, I mean, everything is applicable. Um, designing experiments is just on a bigger, more uh, maybe complex scale that involves many people, different departments, sometimes external vendors. Well, I mean, that's I mean, in some sense that, that that's what you do in academia as well, depending on the size of the pro project you're doing. Um, writing up becomes a huge skill to have if you're um, um, at all good at writing scientifically. It's a huge bonus. Um, because you can understand the science and write. Um, and so that's been very useful for me. And keeping a very, uh, just a broad interest in a lot of, and understanding, okay, this is another thing that I've seen in interviews, um, that when you have a PhD, you really can't focus on the technical details, like you know, you with this angle, like this long, this number cells. Like that's not, it looks, it doesn't, get you anywhere. Um, you really have to understand why is this being done? What is the assay? Um, how does it work? Like just a, a, like keeping a bigger, 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 bigger picture. Um, and that's something that I, I think, again, in grad school, um, you're developing and that's something that I learned there. Um, also, um, how to work in, in teams, hopefully you're involved in projects that involve multiple people and just um, helping out like that. Sometimes you're leading, sometimes you're not. Um, and yeah, I'd say just about everything. It's just bending it in a certain, in a different direction. Um, um, I'd say in, in industry, it's, you have to, the other thing you have to learn is to just drop projects. When that came in, if you have a project that goes wrong, you can sort of flip it around and publish what isn't a negative result, but it's basically the, what you're trying to go after didn't work. Maybe get something like that. In industry, time is money, and something's not working, and project's not going. But quicker, you can figure that out, drop it, cut. And it's hard because you've invested two, three years. And you're like, oh, no, we got to pivot. We got to move on from this, and now. And and like so, a decision gets made, but you need to have the right information. So, making sure the research is going fast enough where they can, the management and everybody can sort of say, okay. Is this going to work? Is this too much trouble? And drop it if if they need to drop it. Mm -hmm. And so dropping it is probably maybe a new skill. Dropping projects. No, interesting. It's a it's it's it sounds funny, super interesting, and I'm sure it's super pertinent because, like you say, you know, in, it's time is money, and uh, you don't want to lose more time than necessary in something that's not going to work for sure. Yeah, and that's what teaching me, like being a part. Like sometimes it has nothing to do with your. I mean, obviously, I was involved in that lead program of needle therapeutics, but it wasn't my, my, my central focus was on the follow on program that involved, eventually involved the gene therapy. And that was going along really nice. Like we were making some great, great progress. And it could have been a great therapy, but then the lead program and all your money just goes away. And the company, and it's not like they did it because they hated us, because they just didn't have any money. And they're like, okay, you guys, you can't be here anymore. Our only shot and goal is to focus entirely on this clinical trial. And it's cruel. It's cruel, but it's, I, I have zero ill feelings. I have all just warm feelings about everything. I mean, it was handled so well. Um, and I don't think anybody had any hard feelings there. And uh, I guess you were pretty self reliant throughout uh, grad school and postdoc. Uh, but there must have been, so, well, with, with, you know, and, and we'll talk about that too, uh, because I, I, always, I always like to, to ask people to remember. Who had a, a big influence in their in their study and in their professional life? Uh, but I'm thinking now specifically, you know, going into industry, there must have been a learning curve for you in terms of culture, in some terms of specific skills. Did you have uh, anyone? Did you have mentors that helped you? 
kind of hone these skills and and learn the ropes of this this new uh, universe that you were getting into? Yeah, and so that mentor before entering industry, I don't think I really had anything. It was a very pretty big learning curve. I mean, aside from that guy, uh, that Kevin Gatsby, that that would sort of give us little things. That was about it. They, nobody really knew, even at Columbia, how to transition really the industry. But once I was there, there was on my. He wasn't actually. He didn't start off as my sort of direct report or manager or boss, um, but he was sort of there. And he had a. P, he was a PhD scientist who'd been in a couple of biotechs. His name's Rick Lair, and um, he eventually became my direct report my manager. He was really good at just, um, and I think I've touched on this before, but just respecting um, others, understanding the situation that they're going through helping them out to sort of further their career. And you, at every level, you need to be able to do this. Um, like even if you're just starting out, there are other people who are doing stuff and enabling them as much as possible is a very good skill to have. And then when you're Bob Langer, this huge academic guy, he still does it. It's still the right thing to do. Um, and so he, and he wasn't, uh, he, it was mostly by example that he would do things like that. Like you, you just sort of saw him you're like, that's, that's the way to do it. And um, he, uh, yeah, he was really great. And I still keep in touch with him too. And so every jump that I've made since in new therapeutics, he's had a big role in um, um, just sort of, because you have to have references like you, um, they want to, your next job always wants to talk to somebody previously that you work closely with. And he's, and Tim, even Tim Kennedy, they'll want to talk to your PhD supervisor. I think he's another person that I'll talk to. And yeah, there are, uh, once you're in industry, I think you need contacts and you can talk to other people that are, um, um, uh, will help you along. But I, I think in academia, trying to reach over, it's tricky. Uh, at least I wasn't very good at it. Mm -hmm. And uh, just as out of curiosity, do you get to mentor people in your position today? No, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, it, it, I mean, it comes in a lot of. Um, um, not formal settings, but every time you interact with somebody who has either an issue or less experience or anything, you you try and do these sort of things. You try and talk about, uh, this is what I did, and I'm not sure if it's useful, but this is what I know. Um, this is what I would do, or this is somebody who could help you out and put in contact. Uh, yeah. Definitely. And and uh, still in on the mentorship aspect, can you share with uh, with the listeners uh, one or two lessons that you know or, or conversations even that that you remember with with one of these people that that were important for you and th that you know not changed your life but that were important in in uh, getting you to where you are today and that you can remember go back and say this conversation i'm here today because of of it or this advice that i got from from my mentor okay so i think my earliest mentor is my mother. <laughs> so I'm going to start off with that one. It's really good career advice. She had, a, like I said, a very good career in IT. And I remember her saying this, and she still says it a lot, even after she retired, is you got to constantly ask yourself, what are you going to be when you grow up? Because it's not going to be the same. It's going to keep evolving. Like you're, It's not like, whatever, you graduate high school, you graduate university, you graduate your PhD. It's not... It was, I mean, I, I think even hopefully it won't stay the same. Yeah, you know, that you'll, you're going to evolve and things will change. And it might stay the same for a little while, but at some point it's going to change. You got to keep reevaluating. So who are you going to be when you grow up? Keep asking yourself that. And that's been very good. Um, very good advice. I think I touched upon just recognizing when other people need help. It's a very good trait to have and helping out doing what you can. Um, and distressing yourself don't let the stress uh, like i mean i know it's easy to say but try to find ways to get to a productive level of stress okay excellent and i guess these two last ones that you're saying you saw them by example like you were saying bob langer rick lair <laughs> yeah it's uh tim kennedy i mean it, I, I find there are these shining stars that that's you, in your universe that you see and you say, wow, they're very helpful. And hopefully what you do is say, wow, I, you want to emulate that. And those, those are the sort of the characteristics that I've, uh, I've noticed and I want to I try and emulate as much as possible. 
this is almost the end of the interview, but still, you know, clearly these, at least these people and well, your mother is your mother, uh, but you know, they, they really inspire you a lot. And, and like you say, they're stars in, in, the, in the sky of your life. It seems that you may have been lucky to, to cross paths with them in a way, but you probably also were listening, were watching and you saw, oh, this person, I need to get close to, to that person. Yeah. What advice could you give students out there uh, to, you know, to keep an eye out for someone who, who could be, who could have a positive, a very positive impact on their life and they, that they may not have noticed uh, yeah. at this time? I guess it, it's, yeah, it's true. Recognizing it when it happens is is tricky um and i'd say listening for me that can be very difficult sometimes i like to you like to sort of be the one talking but really listening and uh, calming yourself down um like for instance when i was trying to make that transition to the industry and there was that second part of the interview and we're at bob langer's um, um, um uh, cottage and there's like there's probably a like hundred people there but uh, there's that one point where there's like he's going to get a drink or something or I'm doing the bad and he just sort of stops and has a couple words. And those couple words are um, you, your sort of moment to maybe ask an important question or or just listen uh, to what. And I think in my case was just listening to what he was saying. And like his analogy, because uh, he's founded so many of these companies, um, was that each one is um, like a child. Um, and I know, dude, you're a parent as well. Is your children, um, you have all the children are going to be who they're going to be. And you have a certain amount of sort of nudging, but they're, they are, they already are from, I think the moment they're born, they're pretty much who they are and you try and help them and develop, but you, you can't like say, okay, no, I want you to become a doctor. I want you to become this. Right? Like it's just never going to work. Um, the, the personalities are really ingrained and companies are a lot like that. That's what he was, um, um, and like so, so to your question, I'd say just try and do your best to 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 listen for it and or or if prompted if necessary. And uh, again, I, I I count myself as a, as an introvert, uh, and and for someone who might have you know identified someone who's interesting and might be afraid to approach them, uh, would you have some advice? You know, some you know a little bit of pep talk. Try and make it um, as easy as possible and as clear. Um, for somebody who's really busy, just get it right to the point. Um, um, and it can be like two or three lines. I remember, yeah, it's a lot of people are just maybe too busy and that, that can help you out. And you can make it as quick and clean, like you know, beat around the bush too much and just be like, this is, and it would help me out a lot. Be very thankful. That would be my advice. And, and I mean, you, you have to do it. And I think in the age of email, it's maybe a little bit easier. It's so easy to fire off emails or send somebody a LinkedIn message or something. Um, just do it, but do it right. If, if the, the worst thing to do is to overcomplicate and write a super long thing. Like I, I think I gave you my bio that was like two pages. <laughs> was like, that was maybe not the best thing, but, but like if you're asking for something, like don't do that. Just keep it two or three lines and easy for that other person to, to help you. If you know how they can help you, just tell them. Just say, could you put me in contact with this person? or whatever it is. Could, could you have coffee to talk about this? Yes. And it's amazing. Like I've had, they never really panned out, but when I was looking for a different position, I remember essentially doing that coffee. I had coffee with the CEO of the company and he had a great conversation. Didn't turn into a, into a job, but I learned a lot doing that. I made the contact and um, it was enlightening. Excellent. All right. And so the last question I have for you uh, is, uh, it's just kind of a, for you to sum up all you know your experience until today, and um, and to to tell the listeners uh, that are now either in their PhD or in their postdoc, uh, and that that are considering going into industry, give them two or three pieces of advice to to you know make that transition uh, as as easy and uh, as as effective as possible, and uh, and also maybe uh, so, some advice as to how to identify their let's say dream job i think trying to figure out what you want to do is it's so difficult um and it's and it's i, I think it's talking to people um and yeah uh, having coffee with maybe people that you're just like wow i'd really like to do that um i'm gonna put it in another way if if i was uh, in my postdoc and wanting to 
uh, you know, to to go into industry. And I I ringed you and said, hey, uh, hi, uh, you don't know me. Uh, I'm David Mendes. And uh, I, I saw you on LinkedIn. Uh, super interesting uh, path, you know, into your position. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm pretty deep into my research. Uh, you know, I, my CV is very ac- academic. Do you have a couple of pointers that you can give me? What would you, what would be the first like three sentences you would tell this person? I'd say that there's this really good podcast series by David Mendez. <laughs> you need to look out there. <laughs> that, you really need to listen to those because what I'm going to say won't even compare. Um, that's probably what I do right now. <laughs> uh, but I'd say, sure, but like, yeah, like oftentimes there'll be people in the area and I just have a coffee or a drink with them. Um, and uh, I've done that quite a few times, mainly because I like coffee and I like to have a beer. So it's like, sure, I have a reason. Um, and that's, uh, yeah. Uh, but calling up somebody and just doing it over the phone, I think is too impersonal. I mean, it's better, obviously, than an email. But I don't know. I've never had that. I don't know how it feels somebody called me um, and that I didn't know. Usually it's through contact. Like, if you can find some sort of connection to that person, like, whatever it is. Um, and usually with email first, just being like, hey, I know you from this. Or if you don't have that, then you send it off. Just hail Mary it. Um, and follow it up. Very rarely will a person say yes on the first thing, and they want to know you're serious and that because they're busy. Um, and that's like how I don't want post doc. You gotta keep following it up. And um, yeah. All right. And uh, and so so from 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 our conversation, our conversation. And one of the things that I that I took uh, and that yeah, probably you don't need to repeat is taking a step back and, and zooming out of your, of your research to be able to tell a story that's more compelling, right? And reading up enough to see how what you're doing could apply to something uh, that the company's doing. Um, Saying so, like, I know that this is an important question in the field, like for gene therapy, it's the, the immune response right now that, that happens to, to gene therapies. Like something, yeah, things like that. Awesome. Simon. It's great advice. Uh, uh, do you have any links, anything you, you want to promote? No, I, I don't really have anything to promote. I think it's um, yeah, definitely anybody reach out to me. I'll do my best to respond. Um, and uh, good luck. It's a fun time. It's a fun time. You have your whole lives ahead of you. And uh, oh, one last little tip tidbit is being a PhD, you forget how few PhDs there are in the world. I think I saw a, a statistic that about two percent of the population of the U.S. has a PhD. You're very unique, and you can forget about that when you're surrounded by PhD. I think this is a great way to finish the interview, and and it's it's true. Even you're, you're saying this, and I'm like, I hadn't realized it myself. I hadn't seen those numbers. And it's true that when you're in your PhD, all you see is PhDs and postdocs around you. So, awesome. Simon, thank you so much. It was great thank talking you. with you. Uh, and uh, it's great hearing, hearing your story and how you, you got to where you are today. And, uh, you know, and to hear that, like everyone, you had difficulties, you had obstacles, and then you surpassed them. And uh, here you are. Here we are. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Good. Take care, David. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Papa PhD podcast. Head over to papaphd.com for show notes and for more food for thought about non-academic postgrad careers. I'll always be happy to share inspiring stories, new ideas, and useful resources here on the podcast. So make sure you subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts to always keep up with the discussion and to hear from our latest guests.